Good morning, everyone. We certainly have uh, beautiful weather, don't we? Uh, Jory and I try to go walking every night, and it's usually with Erica and our uh, dog, and uh, we usually get it going about the time the sun is going down and the moon's coming out, and it has just been gorgeous recently, hasn't it? Haru Onada was a Japanese war hero from World War II. His story is legendary. Uh, he died in 1974. Um, no, that's not true. He, he, he died in 2014. Uh, but uh, his, his story is that in uh, February of 1945, military forces landed where he was stationed and uh, most of his fellow soldiers were killed or surrendered, but he grabbed three buddies and they fled into the jungle. And Onada did not emerge again for 29 years. Um, he thought the war was still going on and wasn't safe. And uh, so uh, in uh, October of 1945, uh, they dropped leaflets from the plane t telling people that the war was over, soldiers could come in, but he didn't believe it. And so he and his buddies stayed out there. They thought it was just, you know, opposition uh, propaganda. And then in... Uh, uh, December 1945, again, leaflets were dropped from the sky, same, same message, and he thought, eh, and, and so they ignored it. After um, a number of years, uh, one of his uh, friends uh, uh, surrendered, and uh, a few years after that, two more of his friends got into a firefight with police, and they were killed. So Zanata, all by himself, was out there, and... Uh, so in 1974, a friend of his uh, hunted him down, and he found him. But he still wouldn't uh, come in. He said, uh, you have to get the, my commanding officer to come and tell me. So he tracked him down, and, and he, he came out and talked to me. He says, hey, man, it's over. The war has been done you know, a long time ago. Uh, come on in. You're done. Like Onada, many of us have wasted time wandering. Uh, hiding from God, uh, running. Uh, Jesus Christ won the war over sin and death, but we may be living as if we've never heard that good news. This is the seventh in our series of messages called Christianity 101. We're talking about what is Christian faith. The Apostle Paul has done a masterful job in the book of Romans explaining how uh, there's a God out there, and we can all know there's a God just by looking at how beautiful things are. There has to be a God behind this. But we ignore God, we reject Him, and so we make a mess of our lives and a mess of our world. He says you can, all people can know there's a God just by the <clears throat> fact that all human beings have a tendency to judge other people. You know, you call a person, does something, a jerk, and, well, where do you get that right? It means you understand the difference that, that what this person did was wrong. There's a difference between right. But even though we know that, there must be a God who set that all up. We ignore him, and we don't do right anyway. And so we mess up our lives, and we mess up the world. Not only are we in trouble, but our crisis is accumulating. We need a solution that is dynamic, that can keep pace with our crisis. And that's exactly what we find with Jesus Christ. Paul writes, read this with me. This is the key verse this morning. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. God's grace given to us through Christ's death on the cross is more than adequate to handle our sin. Paul uh, elaborates on God's marvelous grace, the only solution to our sin uh, in Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 may be the most important chapter in the Bible. If you're an unbeliever, you couldn't have picked a better week to be here. Turn to Romans 5 if you brought your Bible. If you'd like to use the Bibles we have under the seats, it's on page 1130. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
uh, Paul directs us to consider where we are. If you've been tracking with Paul and agree that we have a problem with sin and you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and died for your sins, now you have peace with God. Those are three of the most beautiful words. They're more important than the words, you are cured to a cancer patient. They're more important than the words, you are freed to a prison inmate. Paul uses the Greek word for peace that translates the Old Testament word shalom. It's the greeting for hello and goodbye in Israel today. It's uh, uh, salam, it's equivalent, is the, the same greeting in uh, Arabic countries today. Uh, Paul uses it as a synonym for salvation. Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now in verse 3, he surprises you. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. We're surprised that he mentions suffering as a good thing. Uh why should we glory in our sufferings? He uses the Greek word thlipsis for suffering, which typically means intense pressure. Now, hasn't your experience been that intense pressure causes you to have fatigue, which leads to discouragement or depression? That's what you expect Paul to say. Instead, he surprises you. He says our sufferings produce endurance. He uses that wonderful Greek word, for endurance, hupamane. It's one of Paul's favorite words. He uses it a lot. It means to persevere or hang in there under pressure. Uh, we all face pressures. Not all of them are life or death. We face uh, financial uh, struggles. We face deadlines, uh, national political division, drama at school, uh, maneuvering at work, uh, home and auto repairs. Uh, fights at home. Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. He doesn't say suffering brings despair. It brings hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, whom has been given to us. Paul introduces two great themes that, uh, for the first time in the book of Romans. God's great love and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Many Christians live uh, as if uh, we, we, we come to God through God's grace, Christ dying on the cross, but then once we've given our lives to Christ, we're on our own from there. No, we have to learn to depend on the Holy Spirit step by step every day. Now he talks more about God's love, verse 6. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates, this is a famous verse, his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's remarkable whenever we read about somebody who gives his or her life for uh, another person, good person, giving his life for another good person, but who would give their life for a serial killer? Come on. Who would give their life for Osama bin Laden or Adolf Hitler? Jesus Christ did. Verse 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Uh, God says, if God would send his son to die for us while we were godless, while we were rejecting him, how much more, once we come to him in faith, will he love us? Verse 12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Here's the doctrine of original sin. Paul says that Adam sinned. Then uh, sin caused death. And then death spread to all people. 
uh, as a result of our sin, we die physically and we're separated from God spiritually. Uh, when Adam sinned, he acted as our federal head. When he sinned as the representative of all humankind, he polluted the race. So the sin nature spread to all people. To be sure, sin was in the world before the world law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. You say, how can you have sin before the law to define sin? And Paul says, I have proof, because death was already there, that sin was in effect. It's fashionable today to think about the uh, story of Adam and Eve as mythical. It's just kind of an explanation of human origins and sin and death. Uh, but Scripture clearly intends us to accept as historical Adam and Eve uh, as the original human pair. For biblical genealogies trace our roots back to Adam. And in Acts chapter 17, uh, Paul talks to the Athenian philosophers and says, God created all humankind from one man. And then here, Paul's uh, carefully constructed analogy between Christ and, Set and, uh, and, and Adam requires the equal valid, uh, historicity of both. Moreover, nothing in modern science contradicts this. Rather, the reverse. All human beings have the same anatomy, physiology and chemistry. Although we come from different races, we uh, constitute a single species. And people of different races can intermarry and interbreed. The homogeneity of the human race is best explained by positing our descent from a common ancestor. But you say, don't uh, human fossil records and, and skeletons indicate that Homo sapiens lived hundreds of thousands of years ago? But the Genesis record only accounts for maybe 10,000 or so years ago. It's true that Homo sapiens, a modern, we uh, usually date back to about 100,000 years ago. And Homo sapiens uh, archaic, we date to maybe 500,000 years ago. Homo erectus, we date to maybe 1.8 million years ago. And Homo habilis, maybe to 2 million years ago. Now, I realize that carbon dating is uh, not an exact science. Uh, you know, you find fossil remains or, or skeletal remains, you can't be certain uh, how old they are. But let's assume Homo sapiens existed hundreds of thousands of years ago. Were these human in the biblical sense? In other words, created in the image of God with rational, uh, spiritual, and moral faculties which enabled them to know and love their Creator? Uh, skeletal remains can't answer that question. Even evidence of them making uh, stone and wooden uh, uh, tools do not prove that those uh, Homo sapiens were fully human, that is, godlike. God may have made Homo sapiens hundreds of thousands of years ago, but I think it's reasonable to believe that at a minimum, the Genesis account marks the moment when God placed his image in Homo sapiens and put a soul and spirit within them. It marked the beginning of the human race. Now verse uh, 20. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. Does the law solve the crisis? No, it increases the crisis. The law makes us aware how far we fall short of God's standard. Now, here's the good news of the book of Romans. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's how I summarize Romans chapter 5. Read this with me. God's amazing grace is more than a match to meet our crisis. I want to make five reflections about God's Amazing grace. First, everyone sins. Paul makes clear that all human beings, without exception, have a sin nature. That means that every person you meet in this world is in crisis. That's not up for grabs. 
So why are we so surprised when our kids disappoint us? Why are we dumbfounded when our parents let us down? Why are you surprised when your spouse does something that bothers you? What did you expect? We all have an inborn sin nature. Do you take that sin nature into account when you're dealing with people at work or at school? Do you recognize that you and everyone else has a crisis of sin? Two, everyone is loved. After Paul's analysis that all of us, uh, none of us does good, we expect God to say, you know, I'm just going to let you grovel in your sins. But he doesn't do that. Instead, we read, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Read this with me. It's one of the key verses of Romans 5. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ came and he was hated mistreated by people, but he didn't destroy them. God loves the Caiaphases and the Pilots and the Herods and the Judases in the world. He didn't destroy them. Instead, he destroyed the, the weapons they held, sin and evil and death. The worth of every human being is established in this text. I know one thing about every person I meet. They're loved by God. When you see someone, you don't have to ask if God loves that person. And in establishing the worth of every human being, my worth is established. My worth is secure in the death of Jesus Christ. Natasha Ray found herself uh, in, her, in her car with her two boys uh, in a parking lot in Los Angeles outside the apartment complex they had just been evicted from. She had just moved from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles in hope of a better life. But this didn't seem like much of a better life, to be unemployed and homeless, trying to take care of her two boys, Santana and Mateo. But it was far better than the life she left behind in Washington, D.C. Her boyfriend had been in prison for 12 years. He had just gotten out. When she was 16, she began her relationship with him. Now she's 37. For 21 years, she'd been living a life of abuse and uh, just a terrible thing. When she met him, I doubt that she knew that she was signing up for a lifetime of pain and abuse. For years, she tried to make the relationship work. For a while, she would drive four hours each way so her boys could get to know their father. She put up with his physical abuse, his infidelity, his criminal behavior, all because she thought it was the right thing to do. But after he got out of prison, she was lying there in bed, and she heard a voice that just was as clear as anything, go! And she got up, got in her car with her boys, she pulled together the $2,500 she had saved, and with the help of a friend, drove across the country to Los Angeles. When Erwin McManus first came to know Natasha, he would never have known that she had lived 20 years of abuse and brokenness. She was upbeat. She was a positive person. She seemed to elevate every person she met. She was working for a men's grooming company called Hammer and Nails. And uh, if you ever watched Shark Tank, you may have seen the episode when the owner, Michael Elliott, pitched his uh, um, vision he didn't get the funding he was looking for, but uh, the, the public exposure helped him to get the uh, venture capital to, to realize his vision. Natasha was a woman who spent 20 years in a broken relationship and in abuse. And here she was now trying to make a new life for herself in Los Angeles. Wonder how many of us would have the courage to leave our, a life we knew, no matter how bad it was, for an unknown life for a better future. 
But she did that. She, she went to work for Hammer and Nails and uh, she became head of the, uh, uh, the, the, the salon there. And now today she's in charge of training for all, all uh, uh, staff across the country. And she has her own uh, uh, organic uh, body uh, products uh, that she sells as well. Erwin uh, McManus told her, I want to put you in one of my chapters uh, called uh, set, your uh, set Your Past on Fire. She said, really? It gives me goosebumps. Is that really the title of your chapter? He says, yeah, why does that matter so much? She says, when I drove from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles, one of the nights I stopped at an Indian reservation and I pulled out a uh, spiral notebook and I wrote down all the people that had hurt me through the years, all the abuse and exactly what they had done. I went through all the moments in my life. I filled up several pages. Then when I was done, I took them and I put them each in the fire. I burned them up. She literally set her past on fire. Natasha set her past on fire and allowed God's love to set her free. Third, everyone has freedom. I don't want you to miss this point. Uh, <clears throat> all of us have inherited a sin nature from Adam. But call, Paul is careful to note that our freedom is preserved. Verse 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. All sinned. We can't pin the blame on Adam. Now, some people misunderstand the doctrine of original sin. Paul says, uh, the doctrine preserves your freedom. For if, verse 17, for if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Paul doesn't teach universalism, that all people are saved. Our salvation is not automatic. You don't just automatically have God's grace. You must receive it. God respects you so much that you have a right to receive his grace. He doesn't force his grace on you. Fourth, everyone can rise up. Uh, left to our sins, things only get worse in our life and in this world. They get more complicated. We have a accumulating crisis. All of us have done things wrong in our lives that accumulate into uh, increased crises in our lives. And if you're to heal a, an accumulating crisis, you have to have grace that accumulates faster. God's amazing grace does just that. So read this with me. This is the key verse today. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. This is why we can rise up. Christ is totally adequate to meet our crisis. I don't know what your crisis is. Is it alcohol? Is it a terrible temper? Is it sexual impurity? Is it pornography? Is it overeating? Lying? I don't know, but I know this. God's amazing grace is more than a match to meet your crisis. Parents, you want to keep the focus in your home on grace, not on sins. 1988, Dan Jansen was the best speed skater in the world. Uh, the Olympics in, uh, were held in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and he was expected to win the 500 meters and the 1,000 meters. He had the several best times in, in both of those events. Just before he went on the ice to skate the 500 meters, when he was expected to win gold, he got news that his sister had lost her battle to leukemia. He went out on the ice and he fell on the first turn. Four days later, got back on the ice for the 1,000 meters. He led in world record time and in the last turn, he fell. 
Now, people who are into that sport say, that just doesn't happen to speed skaters. They can stay on their skates as easily as you and I can stay on our feet at the mall. So when he came home, 1988, having, you know, crushing results and uh, having lost his sis sister, he was a very sympathetic uh, person in, uh, in, in uh, America. His next opportunity to win gold was 1992 in Albertville, France. But he came home without a medal. His final opportunity to win gold was 1994 in Lillehammer. Once again, favored to win both events, but he didn't uh, win the 500 meters, which made his 1,000 meter performance all the more special. He won in world record time. But that victory paled compared to what happened next. He skated around the rink holding his two-year-old daughter, Jane, named in honor of his sister who had died. And the crowd was on their feet. They were cheering and they were weeping. Watch it. And, uh, and sure enough, you know, I got to the first turn, really one step into the first turn in my life. This is 1988. He slid into the pads and he just put his arms up like, oh my gosh, what happened? Uh, you know, it was horrible. And... Uh, yeah. It's hard to even think about it. The record pace, and then I it's the and went down. So, and I did. Dan Jansen looks good to be in the lead. Here is Dan Jansen, and he crosses it on 12:43, and he's in first place. It was probably good enough for a medal. I didn't know what color that would be yet, um, but I didn't even care. I was I was thinking if I finally skated to my potential at the Olympics, and uh, that's all that I hoped for. Uh, Dan Jansen experienced the pain of missing out on five gold medals and losing his sister. Uh, but God's grace enabled him to rise up again. So, everyone sins, everyone is loved, everyone has freedom, everyone can rise up. And here's my final reflection. Paul introduces the subject of living the Christian life. Once you Believe that you've sinned and you commit your life to Christ. Ask him to forgive you your sin and come into your life. Then how do you live the Christian life? That's where this series is going to go next. I'm calling it Christian Power 201. Here's my final point. Everyone can handle life with the right perspective of God's grace. Back to verse 3. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. You object. It doesn't make sense to rejoice in your sufferings. How can a person do that? By knowing something. By knowing that suffering produces perseverance. Per perseverance, character, and character, hope. We can rejoice in our sufferings if we have the right perspective. We change our thinking to recognize that good comes out of intense pressure. Have you ever known a person with deep character who hasn't gone through intense pressure? God sends tough times, maybe through the loss of a job, maybe through a sickness, maybe through a death, all kinds of different things. Some of our greatest disappointments God allows for our good. Jesus never promises that if you give your life to him that everything's going to be easy. You'll have a trouble-free life. But he promises to be with you. He's all that you need to handle the pressure. When I was growing up, my father always changed the oil in our cars. He had a big basin. He kept it in and uh, he wouldn't dispose of that until, you know, he'd changed maybe f six or seven uh, cars. And so uh, 
this video strikes me because it reminds me so much of my childhood. I want to, uh, it's called uh, Stronger Stuff. This guy gets all messed up in oil and he can't get it off and he needs stronger stuff to get it off. And then uh, Natalie Grant is going to sing her song, Clean. She says that uh, nothing is too dirty, God can't make worthy. So I want you to watch this and uh, I'll ask the ushers to come about halfway through the song and take our offering. My dad has always been a tinkerer. He likes doing things with his hands and figuring out how to fix things. For instance, growing up, I don't remember him ever taking any of our cars to get an oil change. That was just one of those things he seemed to enjoy doing on his own. And over the course of a few of these oil changes, he would slowly fill up this large metal container with the used oil. And this stuff was dirty. I mean, it was filthy. It was basically sludge. And eventually he would take it to get recycled, but in the meantime, it sat along the outside wall of our garage. And my brother and I, we were given strict instructions to keep our distance. And we did. I mean, we absolutely did. Except the time when I didn't. <laughs> On that particular occasion, I was innocently strolling by when I stopped. And I looked. And I took a couple steps back. And I remember that I could hear the sound of my own heart beating as I looked down and saw myself reflected in that inky sludge. And I knew exactly what I should not do. And I did it anyway. I plunged both hands in until I was up to my elbows. And it was thick and slimy and dirty. Basically, it was awesome. And then, it wasn't awesome. I suddenly realized how much trouble I was in. The oil clung to me even as it was dripping from my fingertips. So I tried to shake it off and it went everywhere. So I, I tried to skim it off and rub it off and nothing was working. So I ran to the garage and I grabbed a rag that was way too small for the job. And at this point, just total panic. So I snuck back into the house, into the bathroom, where I just began to scrub and scrub and scrub with soap and water. But the only thing that I managed to do was smear the oil all over myself and all over the white porcelain sink, all over the bathroom tile. In trying to clean up my mess, I had made it so much worse. So I did the only thing left to do. Dad? I could hear his footsteps in the living room and then in the hallway. And as he opened the bathroom door, I burst into tears. I was so ashamed. And then without a word, he took one of my oil smeared hands and he led me to the kitchen. And from underneath the sink, he pulled out a bottle of this orange-scented, sandy kind of soap. And then he stood there with me at the sink, and he helped me wash away the mess that I'd made. I watched as it disappeared down the drain. Sin makes an ungodly mess. It makes a mess of us. It makes a mess of the things and the people that we use to try to clean it up and cover it up. 
And it simply cannot be gotten rid of unless, unless you're given stronger stuff. And the good news is that when we call out to Jesus for help, he has stronger stuff. All of us have messed up our lives like the guy with the oil. But there's nothing too dirty God can't make worthy. God's grace is more than a match for any crisis in our lives. Do you want God to wash you with his mercy? I don't just mean do you want to give your life to Christ You have to ask him to wash you in his mercy time and again. I know that because I have to. And I've been a Christian a long time. If you want him to wash you, ask him. Let's pray. I want to give you an opportunity to ask God to wash you. Maybe you want to ask him to forgive you your sin and Tell him that you believe that he's the son of God, that he died for you, and ask him into your life. You can do that right now. Or maybe you've done that. You've given your life to Christ, but things go on every week, and you want him to wash you again. You pray. Father, we uh, thank you that you loved us, you love us, even when we're rebellious against you, making a lot of stupid mistakes. You sent your son to die for us. Thank you that there's nothing too dirty you can't make worthy. So we ask you to do that with us. Wash us. Make us new so that when we go from here today, we have new hope, a changed perspective, living knowing that if we've given our lives to you, you go with us. Your Holy Spirit lives in us, giving us all that we need to meet the demands of this week. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.